It's my pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, uh, Igmar Ridel Kuse. Um, so I guess we start at the very beginning. Uh, when he was 10 years old, uh, you know, he discovered video games. He taught himself to code with an enthusiasm towards video games. And uh, you know, it's this type of enthusiasm you really see come up in his work later on. Uh, you fast forward, uh, his undergraduate training was mainly using theori uh, was in theoretical physics. And he did his PhD in experimental biophysics at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, now he's an assistant professor at uh, Stanford doing uh, in the Department of Bioengineering where he studies, where he has two main research focuses. Um, the first research focus is understanding patterns of, of cell development uh, and how they grow, for example, the way an embryo develops. And uh, more interestingly is this whole human uh, microorganism interaction um, area where he is actually uh, you know, leading the invention of these biotic games, which allow you to control microorganisms at the very, very microscopic level and do some really amazing things. So basically, he's been able to turn, you know, a euglena into a controller uh, where people can interact and learn about biology um, in a way that's really never been done before. So, please. In the light of the, of the whole seminar series, the main question is how can we turn microbiology into an interactive medium, right? And uh, it started for me kind of with the idea, let's play with cells, but it's a little bit more than that now. It kind of we've broadened and the activities we can meaningfully do with this technology that not directly play, but are maybe playful. So let me start with something, kind of a little quiz. So what's the difference between these two pictures? The machines on the left are primarily used for number counting while the uh, machines or devices on the right are really made for human experience, right? And although, I mean, they also do number crunching um, on a uh, level uh, below that. And if you look at modern biotechnology, we have, we kind of in a similar stage now that we were back then in the uh, early, uh, late 40s, early 50s in, in electronics, we have, for example, here we have a microfluidic device that allows you to manipulate cells and fluids uh, in uh, very controlled ways, it's an integrated circuit and you can kind of see the lines here and things. It gives you a, a, an idea of how many of those you can control. So it's, it's pretty similar like that, but how can we convert this in, into something like this over the next years, decades, who knows? But these technologies get increasingly more powerful. They're used for research and also for medicine, for example. And so this technology is advancing. Will this go to something interactive like that? And um, for me, this started a couple of years ago, actually, when I started here at Stanford, kind of this idea, if you have this kind of uh, power of um, manipulating uh, biology as microscopic scales, why aren't we playing games with them? Or will this just develop on its own, right? And at some point I thought, maybe I should just do this, right? I should, I should just take this on. But it was kind of intellectual curiosity, right? And uh, if you look at the history of human technology, that's kind of a... a short uh, sum up of that. You can look that each of these technologies throughout history have always been used to be playful, to interact with. And it's very prominent in our society now with, with video games. And uh, it's not that clear what this means for biology, although life science is maybe the hit science uh, coming up that is equivalent to what the information sciences or electronics have been uh, over the past, I don't know, 50 years. So the idea of biotic games then was um, how do we enable a human to play with biology in a microscopic scale and should have something to do with modern biotechnology, right? It shouldn't be a pure electronic simulation, like spore, for example, and it also should not involve kind of like horses, which is ancient biotechnology, right? We wanted to do something novel um, to enable interaction. And here's one of the early examples uh, that we made. Um, so what you see here is uh, paramecium, so it's a single-celled organism, it's pretty large, it's 250 micrometer in size, and this is a microfluidic chamber, a very simple one, where you see the white speckles, those are these, these cells. Um, and you can apply uh, electric fields, and these organisms have a natural response to those fields called galvanotaxis, and so they basically always swim with the field lines. And you can control these field lines with a simple controller. And uh, you bring this in real time on, on a video screen and program some virtual objects on top of it. And you can make a game out of it, right? Like in this case, the, the goal of the game is to get these little organisms swimming uh, through uh, this box and score points by lighting up these dots, right? And so you can argue this is on one level, it's an interactive experiment, it's just a normal experiment, or you can say it's an interactive, playful experience, it's a game, right? And of course, with this uh, sort of game machine, you can make different games out of it just by programming different uh, environments uh, on top of it, right? So this was kind of our early kind of approach to actually conceptualize it, conceptualizing what does it actually mean to play with uh, uh, 
biology. Right? Um, see again, kind of the setup was rather simple at the time, which is good. It's kind of this uh, little uh, microfluidic chamber by the millimeter in size, a simple webcam, game controller, and then putting this whole thing in real time on, on the video screen. So we published this, um, got good responses, both in the more scientific as well as the geeky game uh, literature, so kind of broad appeal, that's always good. Um, and so this uh, made us as a lab think we should continue on this and kind of see what can we really do with that, right? And so what next? Um, so there are a bunch of things that we've been working on since then. And the questions fall, I mean, in technology. I mean, I didn't spend too much time on that, but the games that you saw here, I mean, you can play for 15 minutes, then you have to put new organisms in because they tire out and, and things like those, right? It's not a kind of experience where I turn it off, play for a couple of hours, and then turn it down as we have with electronics now, right? Um, how can we provide access? I mean, I just, just said that, um, that uh, it's not that easy to use, it's even harder to give this uh, in the hands of a, of a child or something, right? Is the game design good, right? To what end is, is the game design? Is it just playing? Was there maybe educational value? Are there certain ethical considerations behind it? I mean, should we play with, with living organisms or not? So a number of questions, and I want to address most of them throughout my talk. Of course, there's still stuff to do, but we've gone pretty far over the past few years on, in, in that kind of area. So <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit uh, about the value of, uh, the educational value of interactive toys. Um, one thing that fascinated me also as a child um, is kind of playing with Lego, and we have these uh, Lego robotics uh, courses, uh, after school program, and, and so forth, where kids are really enthusiastic of building these things, have these uh, competition. And what it does is an in informal way for children to learn about mechanics, mechatronics, programming, um, and this is, is really endorsed in, in, in many ways now, right? For example, the first robotics uh, competition. Similarly, more recently, uh, the National STEM Video Game uh, Challenge has been announced where children basically program video games in order to uh, learn programming, right? And so it's not this kind of formal education. You sit in, in, in a schoolroom and you're, you learn or the teacher tells you to write something down. It's really like getting things done that excite you um, in a very playful, interactive uh, way, right? Um, there are some examples um, uh, how games, especially in, in the biological context, have been used uh, for citizen science projects to really get um, uh, output uh, from many people so that people can really contribute to the uh, scientific advancement. And the two examples here are folded in Eterna, where um, uh, basically tens of thousands of people were able in a virtual environment to play around um, uh, with the instantiation of, of real data and, and try to find uh, uh, solutions. Here, for example, in Folded, people were trying to find uh, protein, uh, 3D protein uh, uh, configurations and were successfully in, in doing so, right? And you can imagine um, coupling these things much more directly to experimentation um, would be even much more powerful. And actually, Eterna, uh, which is concerned with RNA folding, is, is doing that uh, already to some extent. And in our lecture series, you will hear more about uh, these in, in, future, um, in future talks. Um, another thing, just based on technology, but nothing to do with games, uh, we can even think about uh, other applications, for example, online education. So MOOCs uh, have been in the news for the last couple of years. And, and while they are very successful in reaching many people, what has not really been solved, how can people do experiments in these kind of online uh, classes, right? Could you couple uh, people to do experiments, especially biology experiments? Um, there are many scientists, for example, Albert Einstein, that have uh, great insight, great ideas, but they have two left hands and very hard uh, for them to do any experiment, right? Could we couple them uh, somehow, enable them to do experiments? And uh, there's also another thing, I mean, lots of high, very expensive, high throughput exp uh, e experimentation equipment is distributed in various places, and could it be better used and shared, right? So there are many things um, where we can think about how can we enable human biology interaction to, for, for various uh, purposes, right? So um, this kind of all falls un under this kind of uh, notion, how can we make technology um, uh, that enables really wider uh, dissemination, enables people to use it, and what we would like to have is, is um, biology equipment as robust, that it's accessible to non-experts, right? That it's freely programmable, so you could make all sorts of experiments on there. You could put, it's versatile in biological content, so you could think of, you put all sorts of biology in there, and ideally it's affordable, low cost, and so forth. So it's kind of a wish list, right? Um, and so in the following, I want to tell you about a few different projects that we've been working on 
to show you how we uh, can get towards this goal. So the first one is, is a project um, that uses a single-celled organism, Euglena. Um, and uh, uh, we build an interface where children, also adults, can basically uh, manipulate these cells or interact with these cells just by, uh, with their finger by drawing light patterns on a, on a touch screen. Um, so here's a, a movie of that. So you see this, this touch screen, you see these cells, they're about 50 micrometer in size. And you can draw something on the touch screen which is then actually projected as light pattern onto these cells, right? And you can see how this uh, cell, for example, which is um, responding to the, to the light, is actually trapped in, in this light circle, right? And so you can draw things on the screen and, and thereby uh, they will interact. Um, this is kind of the basic setup. So you have a projector, very normal projector, but with some different optics, you kind of project it in the, this into this microscopic scale. And then you have an eyepiece, so you can directly look at these cells, but you also have a camera. And then you have uh, your tablet where you project both what's happening inside uh, the chamber as well as what you draw uh, over each other, right? So here's, this is what the device looks like, um, very technologically. Um, so giving people also an insight of what do we actually do in the lab uh, with professional equipment. And if you look through the eyepiece, you can actually see all these cells, but you can also see what you've been drawing. Yeah? Small kids play. How often do they look through the eyepiece and turn away from the screen? Uh, so they did both, so I can tell you a little bit about that. So we've been using this system now a couple of times in the San Jose Tech Museum. Um, our long-term goal is to have a permanent installation there. And so we're kind of assessing through various iterations how would people, children, but also all ages, kind of interact uh, uh, with that. And here you see kind of an example of this. What we basically found is um, that uh, people are very naturally, and also children, drawn onto the system to draw stuff. So this is, for example, what a four-year-old did. I mean, just coloring the whole screen, and that's great. Other people write their names, draw certain things. And what people notice rather fast is that there is some response there. and. Uh, we had some, some things to actually draw them directly onto making them look through the eyepiece by some signs and things. But what also happens if one, one person is basically occupying the, the screen, then the other person has nothing really to do is looking around and seeing the eyepiece and looking through it. And then it's actually nice that, that uh, you see how, how then, for example, two children interact with each other and say, oh, I can see what you draw, draw this, and do you see what I draw? And so you get additional interactions. You can also get adults involved by putting a a sign there which explains how everything works and you see how the adults actually start explaining to their children what's going on. So there's always a good thing I've been told in museums, so adults want to be appear knowledge knowledgeable to their kids, so you always need to give the written, written thing uh, to the adults and then they look smart for their children. So um, here's another experiment uh, that a person did. Uh, you also see uh, the timestamp, so this is like the whole thing happens over two minutes uh, where the person for the first time interacted with the system. And you can see that a person actually did a real uh, biology experiment, right? Like you see initially um, for the first view how uh, the person just trapped one, but they made a little maze, right? Like as you see here, and then try to see how long does it take for the, uh, for the organism to escape the maze. And you can even say this is like a little microfluidic chip that that person made just within a, in, in a few minutes and were able to kind of interrogate um, those kind of organisms, right? And so it's really, really enabling by very intuitively uh, giving people an experience in these microscopic worlds and these reactions of these organisms. Um, of course, you can make games of it. So this was kind of one of the initial intentions. Um, so here's one example of such a game where, again, we have uh, virtual objects on top of it, this little apple. And you're somehow supposed to, uh, in this game, to draw a light such to make them swim uh, to the apple, right? So, for example, uh, like here, right? And so there's still a lot of questions for us, like what is good game design, both in terms of what makes a robust and fun game, but then also since we would like to have some educational value attached to it, and educational being very broadly spoken, um, how should we really design these games? And that's something we are working on right now. Right? Here's another game where basically you have to get as many as you can inside the box. Right? How do you do it as you draw a big, big thing and then you zoom uh, closer over time? You can also do experiments. Um, so a simple experiment, so you have three different colors you can choose. Um, which kind of color do you respond to? And of course we fine-tune the, the colors a little bit to make this more obvious, but it's true that kind of the blue wavelengths is the one that these cells usually try to avoid at uh, strong intensities. And so you can draw different things. You see how they swim through, through red and green, but not through blue, right? And so um, answer is blue. So a simple experiment 
um, understanding something about the phototactic behavior of these cells. Another thing which is a little bit more complicated experiments and people don't get this as easily, but you can actually also probe where's the sensor inside the cell that actually detects the light. So what you notice is, or what people also notice, that whenever it hits the, the, um, the blue light, it starts turning around, which kind of indicates there must be something in the front of the cell. And if you are really skilled, you can actually draw over the back of the cell and there's some lag in the projector, unfortunately, but if you draw over the back of the cell, you see the cell never responds. So you can do an experiment where you can actually do subcellular um, um, investigations of, of, of cells. Right? Um, here are some very preliminary kind of tests uh, uh, on children, what they see on the screen, kind of asking them to uh, draw these cells. And what you can see is that they certainly draw cells that have subcellular detail. If you ask the kids what, and we did this kind of uh, a number of those in, in the museum, what these are, even though we had kind of science saying you glean on things, basically no one says you glean on. So, um, that's something to work on. Um, but what kids in general say is germs, bacteria, fishes, and mouse. So they suddenly realize it's, it's real, it's, it's, it's alive. And uh, it depends a little bit on the age, uh, what they gravitate to, the older kids more, more towards germs and bacteria. So it also means they kind of realize it's, it's um, something on a microscopic level. And certainly the, the eyepiece uh, really helps uh, uh, with that. I mean, um, and so we think from an from a age group uh, for more formal education, um, presumably somewhere around 12, 13, 14 years is maybe where the kids really comprehend that the whole system very easily, both the technology as well as the, um, what's going on here. And this may actually in align nicely with, uh, with kind of biology education uh, curriculum. So on um, this kind of project, so what I want to uh, summarize here is that we have a system that's really long-term robust, didn't talk about this, but the cells live happily in there for a couple of weeks if we treat them well. Um, it's freely programmable, right, like we can make many different uh, applications. It's, in a museum, it's really attractive for all age groups, four-year-olds were staying there, and really found like the eyepiece is a really key thing. If you take the whole eyepiece away and just have a screen, many people think, oh, this is just another simulation, right? And so the education potential uh, leaves, uh, needs to be lifted up in full. So we now want to do studies on that more, more deeply and would like to have a permanent installation. So one thing that popped up both in our initial publication, also whenever we show this, maybe with 10% of people asking, like, is this ethical? Or what are the ethical considerations of, of that here? And so this then prompted me to basically go to Stanford uh, bioethicist David Magnus and kind of discuss these issues through. Should we do this? Should we not? How should we do those? And uh, wrote a paper about this. And uh, so the bunch of, of potential objections uh, one can have, and um, for example, going to these online comments that we got from our YouTube videos and so forth, and just I name them what comes up. Uh, many of those you actually find, uh, like if you talk about genetically modified food or stem cell research, or so many of these similar types of objections or concerns uh, come up. So uh, one major one is animal welfare, right? Like, I mean, do those organisms feel pain? Right? Um, is this respectful for life, right? Are we doing something that is um, unrespectful? Although respect is kind of a kind of a little bit hard to grasp what this sometimes means. Uh, are we playing God, right? I mean, that's an objection that people are saying. Um, some people say, this seems yucky, right? Like, uh, I don't like this. Uh, it doesn't look nice to me. There's a slippery slope argument, right? Today we do it with single-celled organisms, but tomorrow we do this with monkeys, maybe, right? So, um, trivial pursuit. Obviously, it costs money and time to do these things. I mean, shouldn't we as scientists do something more useful, right? Should taxpayers' money spend better on something else. Um, are there public safety concerns, right? Are these organisms safe? Or maybe in the future, like some pathogen ex escaping into the wild because uh, one plays something like this. Uh, game ethics, so that was something that I brought to the debate, which uh, bioethicists normally doesn't think about. So in the whole video game community, there's also the, the ethics of what makes a good video game, right? And this has to uh, fold into there, of course, as well. If you think, for example, about discovery games, what I talked about earlier, like Eterna and, and so forth, also the question if there are discoveries made and maybe there are patents evolving things, like who owns this if many people work on that. And there are actually a, a number of other, other things. But So those are some major ones that came up. And what we then put forward in, in, in this paper is also like some, some main uh, recommendations how one should kind of um, uh, draw some boundaries to kind of be within in something that, that uh, one can really work with. So the first one is uh, no pain, no harm to these organisms. Um, of course, also not to the player. 
Um, and here very explicitly to address like the organisms we use all single cell they don't have any sort of uh, pain uh, they're not sentient uh, organisms right and on the other hand all the stimuli we use are actually um, uh, physiological ones and these organisms live after we played with them so I would argue we, we fully covered that um, another uh, important thing is always to engage with the, with the public and uh, tell them what we are doing is actually uh, uh, has a positive intention it's part of the reason I'm also standing here right um, I believe strongly that these kind of things we do here could have a, a strong uh, impact on, on education, really helping us uh, society-wide to understand what's going on in, in medical research, in life science research, and so forth. Right? Um, respect for life, um, that's again a little bit harder to grasp, but, but one of the things that, that, that uh, came out for me here is also, if you think about a game like this, you can think about it in two ways. One thing is you say you control the organism, right? The other thing is you can say you control a stimulus and you see how the organism responds to that, which is a very kind of different way of looking at it. And it's maybe also similar like when you play with your dog, right? I mean, are you playing with your dog? Like you throw the stick and you're interacting with it or are you manip manipulating your dog, right? So um, very subtle but, but important thing. And the final thing is, of course, uh, respect the player, right? The person um, who plays it make good games that, I mean, technically are not broken in any sense, but also have a good intention, leave the player with a good outcome, for example, have an educational value. So that's very important, but I think that puts a good um, uh, kind of foundation for us to move forward with these things, and especially develop more technology within this framework, but also um, uh, strive towards education and also other applications that are, have a good positive outcome for society. So. <clears throat> And I want to um, switch gears a little bit. Um, it's the same organism, but now it's not so much about games, but it's about how can we provide experiments uh, over the internet, uh, through the cloud, uh, to school kids so they can do experiments with these uh, simple euglena organisms. And just, I haven't mentioned this, but just to say, these organisms are used in schools widely. So you can get them from, from school supplies, you find them in any sort of pond, right? You can eat them or drink them. You should not, but you could, right? They are safe. Um, <clears throat> and so a typical experiment in a school class is you have them under your microscope, you shine some light from one side, and you see, do they go to the light, away from the light? Things like those, right? Um, and um, so the uh, setup is basically, so this is a, a website um, that, we, that we've built. This is the, the main screen where you see a live view. This is the microscope view that you have, and this is a joystick um, that you can basically actuate uh, four different lights. So this is a chamber has four LEDs, and so you can shine light from different directions, and depending from which light you sh uh, from which direction the light shines, the organisms are moving in, in one direction. Right, right now the joystick is, is showing upwards. This from upwards, you move this uh, joystick downwards, and then you see how the cells move downwards. Right, and so. It's basically kind of the same experiments kids do in school anyway, except now it's over, over a web interface, um, main screen for doing the experiment, and kind of a second camera shows them uh, the actual uh, uh, microscope, okay? Um, and what, the way it works right now is you can log on, you get like 90 seconds, and then the data is saved for you, and you're out of the lab again, you can watch what other people are doing, you get back in the queue, and, and can do another, uh, another experiment. What's also uh, pretty nice and fortunate is that you almost can see, I mean, you see some nice colors and you almost can see kind of eye spots and, and other uh, subcellular uh, details here. So <clears throat> this is basically the, the setup. Um, again, a microscope, a simple a chamber uh, with four lights from, from the four directions. We have some reservoir, so the whole thing, also important, is, is automated enough that it can run for up to four weeks without you having to change much. We have an automatic valve which from time to time puts fresh organisms in, but the organisms that, that come out of it are also, also fine. Right? So what can you do with, with this? On one hand, you can do a qualitative experiment, as you just saw, but then you can afterwards log into a different system, so this is four times sped up, you can log into a different system and analyze your, your actual data. And so what you see here is basically uh, by hand tracking uh, uh, these cells, um, looking back and forth, and you even have a ruler, and note the scale, so this is 0.3, uh, uh, millimeter, so you can measure how, how large uh, uh, your glina is, you can measure how fast it moves, and so we're now in the process of actually getting this into schools and having kids playing with that, I mean playing in the experimentation sense, and then doing some simple tracking, doing some simple measurements, and um, what well, we haven't really implemented then, but it's also 
can you actually then model something? Uh, can you even use the data to, to make models, right? So that's the idea. And one of the, the major uh, reasons is also that, that uh, it's hard for many school teachers actually um, to have microscopes in, in their school, to get these organisms in, um, to, to supply all of that. And it really depends on how enthusiastic the teacher is, but also how many resources uh, the teacher has. And so we could imagine, or well, that's, that's kind of one of the things we hope, that these kind of platforms, um, the teacher can basically have his kids log on, do their homework on, and really do biology experiments and kind of experience these things. Right? Um, so if you look at longer time scales and we don't flush, you also see, so this is kind of uh, almost a month, you can actually also see how the population increases, how these cells grow, how they become more dense, how occasionally um, the, the population seems to partially collapse. And if you look more closely, you can even discover events, for example, like cell division. So if you look at these two, uh, uh, this one cell actually, and then over time you, you see uh, that there are two cells in there, right? And so. It's really, it's not only about like, oh, there's a light response and you move towards the light. There's much more to be discovered in there. And uh, the more time we actually spend in the lab of, of making these devices robust and doing, we all kind of discover various things that we haven't noticed before. Some of it is described in the literature, other things not, right? Um, <clears throat> and so um, this is our interactive uh, cloud lab. Um, it's long-term robust, it's web, web, web accessible. When I say for everyone, right now it's only accessible for those who we give a, a password out. <laughs> and uh, you can basically look at biophysical phenomena on various lengths and, and time scales, right? Like the major thing is, is, is the light response, but there may be other things uh, uh, to be looked at. And uh, we now test in educational settings what were really striking and interesting, like letting some theoretical physicists, for example, play with that, maybe they even discover something and describe it that we hadn't known before, okay? Um, <clears throat> Another project also using Euglena, um, so you kind of notice at some point you have an organism that works well, so you, you stick with that, is um, a kit um, where you can uh, basically build a setup, a simple setup with these four LEDs, similar like the online setup, but play uh, through a, a phone interface. And the idea is twofold. One is kind of the gameplay, but the other thing is making a kit that is low cost enough that one could kind of distribute this uh, among uh, students and they could also build it so they can, could learn uh, things. So um, again, it's, 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 it's the same setup, uh, just to recall this. It's, it's a microscope, a little chamber, um, the LEDs on the side, and then you have some sort of a joystick to kind of actuate the light. Right? And uh, so now we're going to see an actual game um, that uh, uh, was programmed in the lab. So the basic idea is a two-player soccer game. Okay. Um, there's a virtual soccer ball, and then you see these Euglena here, and one player basically has the joystick and then turns on the light and then makes the cell swim uh, into one direction. So right now, uh, the red player is on and is supposed to get the, the ball in, into uh, this goal, right? Um, after some time, basically, uh, the player switches, so this should happen in about, I don't know, seven seconds. And then it's the blue player's turn and actually playing in, in, in the other direction. Um, so a few things uh, to note is you see kind of a general movement of these cells in response to the light, but again, you see lots of variability. Um, you also note what we put down here, right? Like there's a scale bar. So this gets towards the educational content. So children hopefully noticing how big things are. But there's also, um, as, as soon as a cell has basically grabbed the ball, we also measure what's in instantaneous speed. So who, who would have guessed how fast the Euglena moves, right? And you get this right there. And so kind of combining this uh, playful uh, aspect with some more uh, kind of educational content um, uh, is kind of the intention here. Another thing we did is kind of pull out uh, the actual Euglena, which currently has the ball in big, so with the hope to actually um, illuminate some more subcellular uh, detail. The cool thing about this, this system, it's basically uh, an Android phone and a, a lens, a regular eyepiece, which costs $10 and uh, kind of uh, a lens uh, which costs about ten ten dollars. You can with better microscopes. You can even get get better um, resolution of that. When the game is over, you get some stats, and for example, you get like what's the what's the maximum speed that you had during your game, right? Like, I mean, how much is a hundred micrometer per second? So, how much is a hundred micrometer? So, this is a microscope. You can swap out the, the little chamber. You can put a hair under it, and you can notice that your hair has about a hundred micrometer in diameter. So, you can notice that the single cell swims about a diameter of a hair within a second. So those are the kind of things. Um, um, this is 
it's intended to be a constructive kit, so you can build this. Um, so there's a, a, a few um, uh, pieces uh, made with a 3D printer. And it basically functions as a, as a real microscope with a real eyepiece and everything if you take the phone off. If you take the, uh, put the phone on, then you already have uh, acquisition capabilities. And the main difference that makes it interactive is basically then slotting these four LEDs uh, under the microscope as well. Right? So it's not only um, supplying to child a microscope or kind of a game kit, you, you supply both, a microscope and a game kit. Right? Uh, the electronics to get this going, basically the whole schema is this over there, so it's not that hard. So assembling this, you learn something about electronics. Um, we developed something to actually make these microfluidic devices, which is a little bit challenging, but uh, so we came up with something we have double-sided tape and then some pre-cut plastic things, and you can really make, make these kind of chambers, which are like about 100, 300 micrometer in, in depth, um, and kind of about this square centimeter in, in size. And you can also think about learning programming with this thing. Of course, the, the, the game that I showed you is programmed in Android language is a little bit harder, so it's maybe a little more advanced. But you can also think of um, when you have a game like this to actually go to Scratch or some other child-friendly languages and then program something similar in there that what you, what you saw in there. So we're basically in the thing that we have this in a lab and now it's a question like how to get this out, how to get this tested with children, students of all sorts of ages and maybe also how to get it made. One thing would be an open source uh, way where we put all the, the things online, but maybe there's also um, some distributor who would, would like to make those and, and uh, commercialize. Um, <clears throat> would this work in any sort of educational context? So I've been teaching together with Steve Quake, a uh, bioengineering undergraduate class for the past three years at Stanford, and the main goal there is for the students to learn um, everything you need to build a, a device in, in, in the life science life sciences. And the way we did this is basically like the first half of the course, the student learned all these various techniques like optics, electronics, how to CAD, how to 3D print and so forth, how to program. And the second part of the course, the student would build a setup, not a phone setup, uh, a slightly different one. Um, but uh, what it successfully showed is that the students had fun in kind of integrating all these, these various technologies into one uh, final project that evolved around games, right? And, and it's kind of this idea, again, like we have these robotics uh, uh, classes where kids learn mechatronics because they like kind of building robots. So I think we can drive this kind of similar thing here in, into the equivalent concept into the, the life science realm, right? Like building uh, these, these devices in, in the life sciences with some sort of a playful uh, gaming-like environment in, in mind. And actually, so this is impressed now and we will basically the whole um, Course content for this will then also be available for others to, to make similar courses. So um, what I want to um, summarize here is that uh, a kit like this could be education on two levels. One is building and the other one is playing, right? We have this self built kit, already used it successfully, um, kind of the idea in, in Stanford class. And I think um, the idea is it could be something equivalent like Lego Mindstorm, right? Also want to point out that Mindstorms is not a, not a term that Lego invented. It actually goes uh, way back uh, to the late 70s, early 80s, just as a general uh, concept by Papert and, and uh, uh, colleagues. Um, just basically giving, giving children or students a constructive toolkit that you can build things, explore, and, and have fun with, and, and thereby learn, right? And so the next steps here is uh, testing more with children and students and, and making an open source kit. And the final project I would like to talk about is, a, is another cloud lab um, that we built in very different organisms, works on a very different time scale, and which we used uh, also in a, another class that I teach. So just to kind of show you that things also generalize a little bit beyond uh, these kind of Euglena uh, organisms. So what you see here is a Petri dish. The whole movie is actually running over about a day, so it's much slower, it takes an image about every 10 minutes. And what you should note here is uh, the yellow thing here first. This is a slime mold called Fusarum. And uh, the slime mold is a single-celled organism but has many uh, nuclei. And it's kind of like a tubing network. And what you also see are these, these drops here. They are made by a robot. This is basically a food solution that the organism likes and, and likes to follow. And so if you watch the movie a couple of times, what you should note is um, just wait until, until it has looped, that initially the organism starts out, starts exploring, right, finds the food, and then kind of goes with the food, and is still kind of exploring to the side, but primarily following the food trail. It's kind of an interesting organism also, because you kind of have two things mixed here. One is behavior of the organism, and the other thing is kind of 
morphogenesis or development, right? So it's kind of interesting um, to note. So again, the, the whole experiment you see is, is on the course about a day, and, and uh, actually petri dish is about this this size. Right? Um, and so we built uh, uh, robots out of Lego that would do the pipetting for us with the uh, uh, scanner below. So you see kind of six dishes on there. So this particular machine can uh, make six of those experiments. And then we have an interface that works on any sort of platform that you can uh, put in your, your stimuli, also get data back, and then connect this uh, to the real experiment. So just to give you an impression what the students see, so there's a website. You can basically choose your experiment. Um, then you have your current uh, experiment that you've chosen, and then you program a stimulus. For example, here uh, it denotes that now every 10 minutes it should make another drop along this line. This is, gets put into a database, and then the machine actually um, uh, autonomously, on the other hand, always queries whether there's something to do for the machine, and then uh, basically um, uh, executes these uh, uh, chemical stimuli onto these organisms and then an image is taken every 10 minutes um, by the scanner and this whole thing is put back into the into the database and when the student comes back later can look at the look at the um, execution so it isn't it isn't interactive experiments in, in the sense that um, you throughout the day or two that experiments run you can log in multiple times and, and, and make changes to the stimulus and see how it is going but it's not kind of the fast scale as, as with the Euglena, uh, which you saw before, which was real time, right? So, um, as I said, we built this whole thing out of Lego, which had reasons for prototyping for us in the lab, but also may actually be a good way to get this into schools or kind of robotics classes um, for children to build similar systems like that. And, and again, kind of connecting um, biology to these more existing kind of Lego Mindstorm um, um, activities that are out there. And so we put this in a server rack, had, had three of those. And this was important also to already get at certain scaling issues, right? So each of those machines can do three experiment, uh, six experiments with three of those machines. And so you can think about server farms like this for different types of, of experiments that are sitting somewhere and allowing researchers, also students, to do experiments online. And just basically swapping, swapping the machines out for higher throughput equipment would allow you to, to run other, other experiments. Right? So from an architectural point of view, um, before, like with this Euglena system, it was really like one student was logging on to one specific system at that very amount of time. Here we have the, all the users kind of just interacting with the database and all these machines autonomously query whether there's something to do in the database. And uh, what you get out of this is, is actually that these individual machines could execute many more experiments in, in parallel. And this nicely aligns with, with uh, the research paradigm which is out there, like all this high throughput equipment. Uh, in, in, in biology. Right? And so I use this in a, a biophysics um, class that I teach, Biophysics of Multicellular Systems, last year, where the students throughout the course um, were doing experiments. Right? And here you see some examples of what uh, students uh, did. For example, try to see whether you can break the organism in two by making two trails. You can check, uh, student tested if you have lots of food versus little food, whether the organism can discriminate, all these kind of things. Right? And then we asked students to do something uh, with the data, do simple data analysis, but then also came up with models that would kind of describe uh, what they saw. Um, and another high level uh, uh, important feature is also that you can actually track what students are doing. So you need to get proper uh, human subject <laughs> approval for that. Um, you can track what students are doing, uh, which helps you in, in two levels from a teacher perspective. You can actually see who of the, which of the students has problems, who not, you could intervene and, and help. On a higher level, if you do this with many students anonymously, then you can also actually do learning research with it, right? Like you can see maybe there are certain things that is hard for 90% of the students and uh, you realize uh, how you should actually set up things differently. And just to say, these things have been done very successfully, for example, in math, where like hundreds of thousands of kids um, in the US have <coughs> uh, done little math tasks online. And you have very solid data on, on many of these things, how maybe math uh, is, is, is learned by children, but we don't have such a good idea about how children or students go about experimentation, right? And these kind of systems could give us uh, insight in, in that. And so one of the more future ideas then is, uh, this is pure concept art, right? But can we have a side-by-side -side thing where a student can do experiments, that, but then also have a modeling environment where you kind of can make a model, for example, of a genetic network, which is maybe taking place inside the organism, and then letting the simulator run, and then comparing the two with each other. And so um, this could teach students 
but also could even be kind of a discovery tool, for example, for citizen science also. Right? So um, what I want to say here is on, on, on this project is um, it kind of generalizes. It's not only about microswimmers, right? You can really do this uh, with, with many different organisms. Um, the Cloud Lab here we had is really about parallelization, and you can really think about using much more powered high-end machines to really get much more students or people on it. We used it successfully in class and uh, also did some learning research in, in a very, I mean, small uh, form on it. And so we're right now thinking how, would, how could we scale this up, um, use it in a different uh, context, maybe a different biology, and could we even get true discovery uh, being made. So two last slides on, on Outlook, like uh, also in the future. So one thing I always want to want to say is um, that games is also a technological driver, right? It's, um, um, so there are many video games out there uh, which require really good 3D graphics and which huge part of the population actually wanted to play. And what you needed to do is good graphic cards, right? And so what has led to is uh, for what we call graphics processing units, like very powerful um, uh, systems to make uh, this rendering uh, all possible. Um, and then what we use these machines now for, or these units, is actually, for example, making molecular dynamic simulations, many other computational tasks. Right? And it's one of these things, uh, examples where consumer uh, desire actually drives costs of technology that in the end feeds back into, um, into research and other more serious uh, applications, right? And so similar things could happen with these kind of games. I mean, uh, these biotic games uh, and things that maybe technology gets developed, which in the end somehow synergizes with uh, um, devices we use uh, for medical research, for example. Right? I mean, you can, for example, imagine um, on your phone right now, there's nothing that measures your blood sugar and other things, but we will have those devices, right, that really make, make measurements about your body and things. And, um, Having on your on your phone games where you can play with cells and and making measurements uh, about certain biostates may synergize in, in certain ways with each other, right? And the other thing I want to say is um, in bioengineering, <laughs> we're often kind of looking to what happened in, in in computer technology or electronics, and you can argue there are certain kind of uh, relationships if you kind of make a, a, a crude comparison over 50 year differences and uh, for example you can equate the early foundations of quantum mechanics like the discovery of, of DNA uh, uh, DNA structure right you can talk about what are the golden years where things really took off you can also talk about uh, discovery of the transistor which is uh, really led them to integrated circuits and then compare this to like these microfluidic uh, valves for example right and leading to uh, microfluidic circuits and uh, one thing of course to put on there is like when did games come about and actually people made very early on uh, games there's always a debate what was the first video game and things like those but um, if you just equate this roughly we should about now making games in, in biology which we do right so that's good um, so uh, let me summarize um, first of all I'm very fortunate to work with a bunch of uh, very talented uh, people uh, in the lab who do all of these things. Not all of them work on, on kind of this interactive biology. Um, some of them work on more conventional uh, science uh, to understand multicellular patterns. And the main thing I wanna, wanna point out is it started for me kind of with a more game playful experience, but I think now we made much more foray into what I now call human biology interaction with much more serious applications. Like how can we bring uh, good biology experiments, for example, to every classroom, right? Um, the platforms that we have now are getting to the point where really long-term robust, programmable, and we really have very different ways of doing it, right? Over the web, as a, as a phone kit, maybe something like arcade style, right? And uh, there's uh, educational value is really in, in many ways there by playing, by building, by experimenting, uh, maybe learning analytics. We can also think about other things like just being autistic, right? Not calling this a game, but um, making arts uh, with it. And uh, what we are now working on, uh, kind of the next steps, is really how do we get wider dissemination of these devices, encouraging other people to use them, and actually some do already, um, make more user study. And uh, another thing which would really be cool if you can get actual research value, could someone make a discovery on that about biology that's really novel? And uh, how can we uh, increase the variation in biology? Also want to mention our funding sources, uh, 
NSF, MediaX, BioX, and then our collaborators in the School of Education, Paula Blickstein, Dan Schwartz, and also Richard Das. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.